Welcome to the Intercut Podcast, the weekly show going over the TV, movies, and entertainment that people can't cut away from. I am your co-host, Zachary Shevich, and joining me, while he may look different than the last 19 years, his commitment to storytelling remains the same. It's Arturo Zurita. You forgot the extra parts of that, Zach. You must turn off your cell phones, even though you're in the comfort of your own home. Demand that it all be off. I feel like there's going to come a point where, and I I believe Amazon's already made these devices, where when you're watching something, the studios are going to, like, make sure that everything is wiped out, that nothing is yeah. on in your living room in order to, in order for you to have the cinematic experience that they want you to have. But Right. Hey, Download an app that, like, bricks your phone for you two know, hours or something like that. You just can't use anything. It, it won't let you get up or anything. I love how Willem Dafoe said it. He's like, you can't count a view on Netflix because you don't even know if I fully viewed it. So he may be onto something there, and the studios are going to hop on it. But we'll see. I'm just yeah. glad we still got Virtual Fest. Yeah, yeah, uh, we are still in the virtual festival era, even if it is somewhat with one foot out of it. Uh, Mm -hmm. We're we're gonna get into the 2021 Tribeca Film Festival on this week's episode, and Tribeca marks the first major film festival in the United States to host in-person screenings since nearly all theaters shut down last year due to COVID. It's crazy. That being said. They didn't invite us to those in-person screenings, so we've been doing what we we're doing what we've been doing and watching these from home, attending virtually. Uh, Art, now that we've done a few of these virtual film festivals, what did you make about the virtual Tribeca experience? I mean, so there was like that whole era right before we got into this year's uh, uh, with Sundance, which I still think has done the best. Um, mm-hmm. South by glitched out a little bit. Um, but from what Chicago did last year and AFI did last year, Philly, Philly Atlanta, New Orleans, uh, I'd say it's in the realm with those. It, it wasn't mm-hmm. a, a, a bad way to host it. You know, it's a, in its own native app. You're able to have the screenings all appear to you, uh, just like with different availability. So it's like it's available mm-hmm. for you throughout the entire festival. Just some won't be available till a certain time. Uh, some will get pulled without you knowing, which I think is what you, you will be able to discuss more about. Um, so the, the, the platform itself wasn't bad. It seems to me that it was more so the side of the offices in Tribeca not being in accordance with everybody. Yeah, and I don't know if this is everybody's experience with the festival, so I don't want to uh, a lot speak of people, necessarily though. for like a ticket per- buyer. But uh, you know, I'm in the realm of following a lot of critics, and a lot of critics were really frustrated with uh, what Tribeca did on on their end because uh, there was a lack of communication, a, a lack of outlining exactly what would be available and when. I think it was two days into the festival that we got an email letting us know that a few films that were expected to be on the uh, virtual platform were just not going to be available virtually at all. Uh, So when you are somebody who's trying to plan your coverage of a festival, that is really frustrating and throws you off. You know, you want to be able to have that information. So that is why I, I saw so many critics really frustrated with this year's, this year's Tribeca Festival Rightfully experience. So. I don't know if that's uh, what the common person's experience of the festival was. I didn't really see a lot of uh, just regular people talking about <laughs> well, the festival. No one goes so, to these it, virtual festivals. Like, when you really yeah. think about it, no one's doing it unless it's a really big name. They're not pushing it a lot, which is one of the big reasons why having in-person, you know, same thing with streaming and cinemas. People want you to go support that box office. Of course, mm-hmm. it affects the film festivals as well. So it's like a right. really big push that they need. And that's why making sure that the press is able to see these movies, just in general. Like, I mean, I don't know if I ever got accredited to this one. I just found a way to watch the movies. And I've always said, like, one of the biggest things, you know, for you to do is if you had the means, the capital to be able to purchase these festival stuff because you're going there for the movies then you're Mm -hmm. able to cover anything at your own will but it's a push pull these tickets are expensive these tickets add up and especially uh when you consider that these critics are taking the time out to watch all these movies and have to pick and choose which ones they they want to cover what's going to give them you know the best traffic for their sites it's a whole game that they have to play so for tribeca to not have been i guess just as open to, to, to let yeah. people know what was going to be available, what wasn't, uh, you know, make some critics feel like it's a it's a waste of their time to a degree. Um, we still got the chance. We you and I always find a way to, to watch yeah. these things, whether we're approved or not. Um, but exactly. I get it. I understand the frustrations from a lot of press people. Yeah, and, and to, setting aside the uh, the like lack of information around a cert, uh, certain screenings, there were certain movies that, based on the way that they structured this year's Tribeca Festival, were just not part of the digital platform. Let's talk we about talked those. about the That's beta test. 
uh, uh-huh. which was the latest from Jim Cummings and also the only movie that was in the Berlin Film Festival to not do any virtual screenings, which I, I don't know. I guess Jim Cummings thinks he's on that level. Uh, it's in they, independent cinema, you know, by not mm-hmm. having it accessible to the most limited degree. Anthony yeah. Bourdain's. Anthony Bourdain's documentary, Roadrunner, that we're really excited to check out. Uh, still waiting to check that one out. Not on the virtual platform. That'll be in July. Uh, all the movies that were in last year's Tribeca that got brought back, brought back for this year's Tribeca, not available on that digital platform. So they are sort of doing the selectiveness. And in particularly, it is those big movies. The new Soderbergh movie, uh, No Sudden Move, which is part of the Tribeca Film Festival, only available in, in person. Technically, In the Heights was the opening night movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, but again, it's in-person screenings. Uh, and, and the thing about that, that is interesting is one of the ways that I think we've seen film culture change for the better because of COVID lockdowns is that accessibility has been much more widely available. It's been granted to a lot of people, people who didn't normally have the ability to go travel to film festivals. Like we talked about do have that ability to take part in it. And Mm -hmm. while I, I do hope that if they have to do, if there has to be an in-person thing, um, that they are able to continue doing a hybrid festival like Tribeca is. I am a little bit worried about the hybrid version of the festival being kind of like not really the full thing, right? Uh, yeah. If if people at home are just not going to be able to access what the really big screenings are, mm-hmm. uh, maybe we are losing a little bit of that access- accessibility. I don't want it to all go away. Is this something we've discussed? Because we know by next year, uh, I believe South by hasn't fully announced yet, but Sundance has that they will still be doing a virtual selection to it. it the best, the best case scenario is that it's available on both. But yeah. if we're being honest with it, the really big films, the really big premieres, are not going to be. And Tribeca is just the first to show you that. No, some of them are going to be reserved, some are not. As long mm-hmm. as the shorts are. As long as like the independent movies True. that you usually wouldn't give the time of day to go to. I'm so not for it. You know, I, we have the means and the ability to be able to go mm-hmm. to these festivals. You know, it is our job as well. Not a lot of other people have the ability to do so. Uh, and even then, I'm still saying, I wish it was available for streaming. But I understand the studios get to dictate it at the end of it, whatever the production company is. But if it's a big movie, they won't have a problem finding people to go watch it, to go to Sundance, to go to New York, to go to wherever they need to. Toronto, Dune. Mm-hmm. <laughs> of course, they're not going to offer that up now that uh, Tiff has said they're going to do that. That will have yeah. its audience and the people who will go see it. But I think this it still gives an opportunity for all, all the shorts programs. It gives an mm-hmm. opportunity for a lot of the you know the minor docs or smaller indie films that people may not see. A lot of the stuff that's in competition, you have the ability to have it up there so that people can see it from the comfort of their own home, so that people can see it, frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think even and- for press, it's a it's a perfect way to weave in what you have to schedule in person and then what you can see at home or while you're waiting or however it is. I hope it doesn't right. go away fully. Absolutely. And that's something that we've talked about, too, is like we've gone to Sundance festivals where, yeah, it's impossible to get to a t- get a ticket to some of the highlight premiere screenings. Mm-hmm. But then there are these documentaries that are really, really amazing and they don't fill out the theater. Yeah. And it's you'll a shame. To decide which one do you want to see, the big one or the small documentary? And it's like <sighs> if it's but if it's made virtually, then it, it is that much easier to see. So much easier. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. So in a little bit, we will get into all these sons, the novice and more Tribeca Film Festival films. But first, make sure you're subscribed, not just to the Intercut podcast on video at youtube.com slash intercut pod, but also the audio podcast available on most podcatchers. Also, follow Intercut on social media, whether it's Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. We are at Intercut Pod. That's at Intercut P.O.D. That's short for podcast. We're also at Intercut Pod on Patreon, where you can support the show for as little as one dollar a month appreciate and you be sure to leave us a five star review on apple podcasts it makes me happier when you realize the twist in a movie seconds before it happens you know like sometimes people feel, feel like a movie can be predictable when they see what's coming but i feel like sometimes that's just a sign that it's so well written that it can only happen one way mm-hmm. i don't know if you you get that maybe i maybe i'm just smoking too much or something yeah but so I, not false positive not, not false positive. <laughs> no, there's there's a better version of that. I got you. Um, all right, so let's get into let's some get into of it. the Tribeca Film Festival slate. 
Uh, we're going to divide this between the docs and the narratives. <sighs> and let's kick it off uh, with one of your favorite documentaries from the festival, okay. Accepted. This one is directed Ooh. by Dan Chen, and it is a look at the students of T.M. Landry Prep School, who had a stunning 100% college acceptance rate until a New York Times expose revealed some of the school's controversial teaching methods. Art, we've been talking a lot on Intercut in the last few months about this wave of documentaries about how the pressure to get into college is killing our kids. It's a genre. Yeah, it's the, whether that's the Chasing Childhood documentary, which I think is actually available uh, widely now. Check if it uh, out, you're solid. curious about checking that one out, uh, it, what was the one that we loved from Sundance earlier? Try this harder. Year? Try harder. Great documentary. Uh, there's a few of these like this. How do you think this one stacked up to it? What did you think about Accepted? Fantastic. It rightfully sits up there. I don't know if it's better than Try Harder. But it's like the fact I'm even contemplating that shows how much I liked it. I saw this one twice. I had to show it to Alina the next day. Um, Like Zach said, we've had the ones that cover them in childhood, like literally in elementary. We're missing the junior high one. But uh, we've we've got two of these uh, that go from high schoolers doing their damn hardest to get into these universities, these very prestigious Mm -hmm. universities. And right off the bat, we're going to be discussing both of these. You know, both of them either cover the parents this one, to me, while it's focusing on different things, uh, like the actual prep schools, the one thing that never gets focused on is these damn universities. No. It is mm-hmm. the universities that, that are demanding all of this pressure, that are demanding all of these extra things that need to go in the transcripts. Um, but both of these movies, or all of these movies, what they cover is usually the parents are the ones who are pushing them. But that's because right. they're trying to get them to meet that goal of the university. The, the school is doing different things that, what, that uh, it needs to go through in order to be able to achieve what they need to, to get into the school. Uh, I thought this one, this one was fantastic because there's a level in documentaries where you realize that in order to get a really good documentary, it's not necessarily exposing, but you are milking the, the characters that you have on screen. And it is mm-hmm. split between the beginning of the documentary and having full access to this prep school. He is not holding anything back on how he tries to teach these kids. That's that's one of the things that's really crazy in the presentation. And, and it speaks a lot to the characters they're showing because right away you're, you're given this access to the classrooms mm-hmm. and... and, and shown a side of their teaching methods that is downright like abusive and they don't blink an eye really like he's, they, t- he's telling them he's like it's either i raise my voice or like you're not, just not going to make it in this world he's giving them the mm-hmm. reality of how it is but he's not hiding any of it no and look for some people that's like a that's the way to to raise a young kid it's but a rorschach you, test of a doc for sure yeah, you, you see that there's a lot of people who are, who are a lot of children who are really, really negatively affected by the the teaching style. And also, I I think one thing about the presentation of it is, if this is what they are showing you, what are they not, showing, not showing you? you. Exactly. Right? Uh, so so immediately, you know, red flags are raised when you you, you see some of the footage uh, early on in this documentary, and then to see the way that it unfolds when when confronted with the idea that there is some wrongdoing here, I think is also a really interesting examination of how a community responds to some kind of internal tragedy, right? Because mm-hmm. to to a certain extent, I think a lot of people don't want to admit to being a part of something that's so negative. And, and in a way, I think that's why you see the, the school seem to sustain itself through, through all of this. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause there's an incident that happens. Of course, there's a true story. You can go search it up. Uh, The incident happens that changes everything that's going on within that school. And it starts following the kids, the individual students who have decided to left us to leave the the prep school. Um, That all ends up culminating not only in their own graduations and, and how their paths are leading, because the whole point of going into the school is that they're going to help you get into the university of your dreams. If you don't have mm. that, can you still make it? And then they bring in one of the biggest events that happened with universities in the past <laughs> five years. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it, it, it ties it in very beautifully in a way where it's like, without getting too much into spoilers, I guess, of a true story, that uh, kind of dichotomy of like, 
are you going to do what you need to do within a system to survive or does that make you just as culpable of being in this broken system? Um, and I think the documentary does a really good job at breaking that down and seeing the victims of people, the people who are just trying to get ahead and mm -hmm. um, just the corners that may be getting cut because there is no other way to survive. And that's kind of like the reason why he was teaching the way he was teaching. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it got to me. I think that at the ending, when you see these characters, real people, these real kids, uh, it, like realizing the system that they're in, because they don't know the game that's being played until right. they're the ones who get played. Um, I think it's a fascinating documentary. I added up there with Try Harder. I added up there with Chasing Childhood. And I feel like we're just going to continue getting more of these uh, until something changes. But at the end of the day, we can look at the prep. We can look at the family, the parenting. These universities are the ones who are making it so difficult. Mm -hmm. And I'm waiting for that doc. Yeah. I mean, we got that a little bit with uh, what was the Michael Modine thing that was on Netflix, Var Varsity Blues, whatever. Yeah, I guess that kind of counts. But, it, but again, it, I, I wouldn't say it's they quite didn't get as in trouble. In when we think about that case, we don't we don't see the, the university people getting in trouble. We see True. the high profile parents Lori getting Loughlin. in trouble. Exactly. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm still waiting on that because it's we still don't we're still not touching these prestigious schools. But I feel that's part of it. All These Sons, a documentary that I've been looking forward to, although that feels like the wrong word choice, for, for quite a mm -hmm. while, because this is Bing Liu, Oscar nominee Bing Liu's follow-up to his stunning debut documentary, Minding the Gap. And here he co-directs alongside Joshua Altman, who was his editor on Minding the Gap. So they're forming oh, nice. this uh, new partnership. And uh, I, I think I like this that. one is... While it doesn't have the personal qualities that kind of make Minding the Gap so transcendent in its depiction of, of these young boys, it does have a lot of similar intimacy uh, in, in, its, in the way that it tries to depict its story. All These Sons is a look at the life at life on Chicago's south and west sides amidst gangs and gun violence, and it... it while it mainly focuses on these two men who are dedicating their lives to try and curb the gun violence in their city, I think one of the things I really love about how Bing Liu puts this movie together, along with his uh, co-director Joshua Altman, is it kind of feels like a baton's getting passed in certain ways, where you go focus on this one pastor, and you, you go to his church, and then you go follow one of the people who's at the church, and then you go see what his life is like, and then you talk a little about about what that uh, aspect is, of Chicago is like. And then you mm -hmm. focus back in on another guy and you're, you're constantly sort of moving between macro and micro and different stories as you move along with these people. I was really blown away by how all encompassing yet focused uh, this look at the situation of gun violence is. Art, you were really excited for this one. Chicago is your city, so you, you know it, this is much more intimate to you than it is to me. So tell me, man, what was your response to all these sons? Uh, when you told me that it was Bing Lu who was going to be covering this topic, I was like, there is nobody better who can actually get into the subject matter without exploiting it. And I think the way that yeah. you brought it up, uh, the way he tackles the story is the same way that one of my favorite documentary miniseries of last year was able to handle it. Um, I don't, why am I blinking on the name? City So Real. City So Real. Uh, doing the exact same thing and where it's going to all the different districts. Here in particular, like you said, it's mm -hmm. just focusing on the west and the south side. The whole way Chicago was built is that it just continues to push out and push out and push out. And there's this uh, really interesting, right at the beginning, uh, moment in the movie where he's following this dude and he's like, yo, you know, this is the person who's, who, like... You know, works here is the person who comes through here. We take the bus right here. I don't know this guy, though. And it's the construction worker. And mm -hmm. the way that they capture the movie is that there's, you know, the community that they're in that they're trying to focus on with construction workers just in the back and, and a construction worker here. And they're just in the background and they speak volumes. If you have a mm -hmm. double, uh, double feature with this and the five-hour <laughs> miniseries that is City So Real, you start seeing the infrastructure of how Chicago is built, this one Chicago where it's really just the population of downtown decreasing so that they mm -hmm. can increase it back up again with housing that is not affordable for a lot of people. And thus, where do they go? The West and the South. And it just continues to put more and more and more and more pressure. And there's a part of it where they realize, you know, everyone is coming in to build while all of these tragedies are happening. Mm -hmm. which makes all this land that's got an incredible view of the city as cheap as possible. And they're building it under people's noses 
to take advantage of it to then move them out even more. And there's like uh, the, the groups that they're following realizing that like, no, we need to invest in what we have as well. But it's also following the trauma. Uh, Chicago also mm-hmm. had another documentary from Gene Siskel's nephew, I believe, called The Road Up. It was one of the ones that we had discussed from the Chicago Fest where yeah. they cover the CARES program. It's, it's kind of similar to the, to the two um, organizations that we see in this movie in where they're doing the exact same thing of showing you how to handle a specific situa- a situation, but also why the trauma becomes a cycle. Because it's not just a kid. It's a kid who's following the trauma from their dad and their grandpa. It is this entire cycle of hate, uh, as one of the, one of the um, subjects in the movie puts it. I want this other group, this other people, to feel the exact same pain that I'm feeling right now. And I won't stop until they feel it. And once they feel it, they're going to feel the exact same way. And... I, I thought they captured that perfectly, especially when, like you said, they're covering the different vignettes of the different people around uh, the town. Especially when you consider the title's name, there's this whole, I'll call it a discussion that happens between a father and a son about what mm-hmm. they need to do in order to, you know, survive. No, you go do what you need to do. I'm, you know, I'm going to do what I need to in the streets. I thought it was, I can't wait to watch it again mainly because of just the little vignettes that they had going on with it. I did not get to see the behind the scenes. That's one of the best things that Bing Lu talks about, especially with, with Mining the Gap and the interviews that he did for that run mm-hmm. on what he does as he's covering the different places. But no, I thought it was a fantastic look at it. Again, I highly recommend City Surreal. I highly recommend The Road Up. Yeah. Right. yeah. It was a good dog. No, I, I, I don't want to say yeah, it's like a great a lot... dog because it's, it's, it's sad, you know, yeah. but... No, but it, it's really affecting, and I think it's really powerfully made, and I think one of the things that's really great about it, you, you talked about some of the things that it mentions, but it, the way it's able to connect all those dots, like it and how it'll cover uh, police violence and police budgets, or how it'll cover gentrification and, and you know realigning of the neighborhoods, and how none of those aspects are the whole documentary, but they're all different pieces of it, mm-hmm. because you need to know all those different pieces in order to know the story of it. And... Uh, it's very elegantly made in how it weaves all of that all of that together. So one of the standout documentaries from Tribeca, for sure. Uh, moving on to another one that I know you responded to. This one was the best documentary feature winner. It is Ascension, an observational documentary about contemporary contemporary Chinese life and the pursuit of the Chinese dream, which prioritizes productivity and innovation above all. Jessica Kingdon directed it. And one of the things that I found really interesting about it is that Dan Deacon did the score, the uh, famed electronic musician who also did the score for another documentary we liked earlier this year, All Light Everywhere. And I think Ooh. both of those documentaries kind of share this very ambi, like this ambiance, this sort of contemplative, observational nature, where you sort of let the documentary almost like wash over you with its mood. You know, it doesn't feel like necessarily comprised of of scenes so much as moments. And in the way that it strings these moments together really does give you this unique impression of life in China at this moment. Mm-hmm. I was really fascinated by it. Even if it's a little bit slow moving, yeah. it's entrancing. What do you think about it, uh, Ascension? Uh, same. I can't remember what there was another doc that played at Sundance. I want to say it was called like Human Flow. And it did the exact mm-hmm. same thing where it just like it just covered human movements and and just the the, the way uh just the different patterns that we see and this in particular just being the hustle and bustle of how china was china's working at this point in time and like you said it's just like different vignettes that you see you 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 see somebody creating something over here and then you're at a sex factory a sex doll factory and you're seeing just the intricacies of what they need to do to get this sex doll prepared and ready no, I agree with you. It's very slow, but it is uh, mesmerizing. I mean, and now you're telling me that it's the same dude who did the score for All Light Everywhere, and that's another movie where you're m- at many points just seeing how the camera is made, <laughs> mm-hmm. that that an officer is going to wear. You're you're seeing just the different uh, aspects of how uh, a camera system is viewed, and I think the score has a big part of it as well. I thought it was a very solid doc, a very beautiful looking doc. Yeah, and I'm, I'm curious. I haven't seen any of her other works. I think she had a previous one as well because I think this was her return to Tribeca, if I'm not mistaken. But no, it's pretty, really solid doc. Bitchin'. 
the sound Rick and James. fury of Rick James, a profile of the legendary funk and R&B icon, capturing his life story and all the ups and downs. This one's directed by Sasha Jenkins. I feel like if you're our generation, the, the Chappelle skit is going to be the first thing that comes to mind. Like, no matter yep. what your familiarity is I'm with Mary Jane or Super Freak and stuff, that that's just become so iconic to, I think, people with it, like, you know, uh, 25 to 35, is it? And thankfully, that's, like, a decent part of this. Like, they, yeah. it takes a decent, there, there's a whole, like, storyline about it. I was very interested to to see, like, what that actually meant to him and what role it had in his life. And, you know, it, it it, I think it's one of the things that's really cool about the documentary is even though it is one of these films that does feel like it's approved by the family, mm-hmm. they actually do get into some of the weediness that's and some crazy, of the yeah. unsavory elements uh, that happened along along the way in his life. I thought this was a fascinating profile. Uh, I know you like this one too, right, Art? Uh, this was one of the ones that I was waiting to become available. I wanted to see this so bad. I've done my little deep yeah. dives on... Uh, Rick James, he is an absolute genius. He is the person who created Super Freak, and then MC Hammer took that same note. He pulled a Vanilla Ice, and then the din 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 mm-hmm. and surprisingly made more money off of that, off the, off, off the remix from from taking uh, the, the, the bass line from Super Freak. <laughs> that said, he is an unhinged person, as creative as he is, and you're right. We have always talked about these documentaries that are able to get access to these uh, subjects, and usually, you know, they'll lean one way or the other. This, this, this put it out there. Like, he was mm-hmm. not always the greatest. I mean, one of the big lines from the Chappelle, Chappelle sketch is, cocaine is one hell of a drug. They get into that in this movie, uh, definitely. Um, but I thought it yeah. was a very good introspective of, like, the city that he was raised in Buffalo, just his different inspirations, the passing of the baton to a degree. Not really, because it was almost like a steal that happened between everything that he had. Um, and then that other people were able to run with, you know, a lot of people would say Richard Pryor to like Eddie Murphy. It was what, what he did. And then leading to Prince who toured with him when he was young. I think it's a really great yeah. look. Um, the Prince stuff was awesome too. The Prince stuff was dope. Uh, and even the Michael stuff that they, uh, scattered there a little bit. No, I think it's a fascinating look at him. I, I love that they had at the beginning when they had the interview, uh, in Buffalo. And I was like, why does this sound like Griselda right here? And yeah, it was, it was Conway. <laughs> so, uh, I think this is a very good look at the man. And his career, not only musically, but uh, just the addictions that he had, the power struggle that he had, and just his overall legacy. I definitely check this one out. Absolutely. Let's get into Clay Dream, which uh, fascinating documentary. Looking, you didn't at know about the- this. I I didn't know the whole story behind what this actually is because well, it's thank God we have Clay Will Dream. Vinton, mm-hmm. who who's like a pioneer in the field of claymation and founded uh, the, these uh, his old studio which has morphed into Leica, and it's not exactly the prettiest picture of how Leica came to be, which makes me feel a little bit ugly as a big fan of a lot of the work that Leica does. I told uh, you, screw that Kub- being said, Kubo and his two strings. <laughs> that being said, uh, get, this documentary is really, really interesting. I, I, I love a documentary that shows you a pioneer in the field that's able to really explain how that pioneer was different and, and, and the impact that they had. And w- through not only the interviews that they have, but the, the footage they're able to show, all of those old short films, you really do get a sense of why this guy mattered so much. Uh, I thought it was great, but yeah, I know this was one of the ones that you responded to the most at the festival. I can't even remember what video we had done, but uh, I did a whole breakdown on Will Knight, the founder of Nike, his son, um, who was a rapper at one point. He is the person who is running Leica. Chili uh, T. Chili T. He runs Leica, and I do think that Leica's had great success. There's there's no taking away from the stories that they have made. Uh, they, you know, they got a globe for a missing link not too long ago either. But there is an entire story of an actual pioneer who we're covering in this movie going through a, what you would call a Steve Jobs um, type scenario. He wanted to create his own Disney and it didn't really turn out that way. But nonetheless, I love the behind the scenes that we were able to see of his creative process, uh, his own personal struggles, all while at the same time, it's like the 
what do you call it? Not it's not dissertation. What do you what do you call the thing that they had where they were uh, when they were sitting down with the lawyers? That that kind of like cuts the whole movie oh. as it continues to cut back <sighs> and forth. But you know what I mean? The ar- you, yeah, 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 arraignment or something. Yeah, I'm so you're forgetting you're, the word. You're seeing this whole uh, lawsuit that's happening between the two of them, um, mm-hmm. and it breaks down the story beautifully. I I know this story very well, so to sit down there and to see how they were able to cover it, to see how they were able to not just follow his work but compare it to other people who were growing at the time with mm-hmm. Disney acquiring Pixar, creating its studios, and how he had the dreams to do all that, and it never came to be. Uh, I think it's it's fascinating, and claymation is just one of the most interesting art forms out there. Um, so I would highly, highly, highly recommend Clay Dream. Even read up on the story if you can before going into it. It's it's yeah, definitely very fascinating little yeah, thing. The, the story of Will Vinton. Definitely uh, keep Clay Dream on your radar. One of the documentaries I didn't get to check out was Larry Flint for President. <laughs> at, it's assembled from footage. There's never yeah. before seen footage in 1983. The film documents. Uh, the controversial Hustler magazine publisher's unlikely run for the White House after a gunman's bullet left him partially paralyzed. Art, tell me about this documentary. I know the director knew very little about Larry Flint, but her uncle, if I'm not mistaken, was the one who had recorded the entire presidential run. He was his like photographer, videographer, so she had all of this footage to use. And she, she said she really... Try to just keep to that footage. So you're following this entire run that he had of running for presidency because they always wanted to mute him. Obviously, he was very unhinged as well. He's a very unguilty person. It wasn't just showing pornographic images, but very graphic images as well. Mm-hmm. And he's very much pinned as this pioneer of free speech. You know, they have a lot of Zappa footage in there as well, little interviews that were caught during the run. And while it sticks to everything that's just dealing with him trying to run for president and all the backlash that he gets during the Reagan administration because that's who he was running against, they do sugarcoat a lot about Larry Flint. I know that this was a, uh, the movie that Woody Harrelson was in where right. he played Larry Flint also got the same type of backlash because it it's seeing him as this pioneer of free speech, but you're forgetting that he he. Just so you know, he did a lot of crazy stuff as well. And and to me, that's why the bitchin' documentary is a lot better because it doesn't sugarcoat any of that. It shows you that, yeah, mm-hmm. this man was a genius musician. Uh, he also had issues. This one, right. they cut a lot of that out. And, and you could have easily put that in there. It was still during a period of time where you're not completely sticking to the archival footage that you have. You, are, you do have some cutaways and you could have easily showed that to flesh it a bit more. It's still a great documentary looking at that period in time and a lot of the backlashes that he was getting and an America that was very stern on, you know, he, he was still pro a lot of movements and, and mm-hmm. minority groups. And while it does a great job of breaking that down, at the end of it, you still want a fleshed out doc. That's one of the big things that I have with documentaries is that you still need to make sure that you're telling the whole story. And that's the only thing that really bothered me from this doc because the stuff that they hid, it's pretty nasty. But uh, if you don't know anything about Larry Flint, um, this one pins him as a hero, but I would highly recommend just reading his wiki page. <laughs> that should give you more than enough. <laughs> but what a character. Cool. I will say that. What a character. Yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. LFG premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival. This one, I think, is already available on HBO Max. So okay. if you're curious about the story, you can check it out. It chronicles the U.S. women's national soccer team and their current fight over unequal pay for yeah. their uh, participation in you know playing yeah. soccer games for the, Na- the U.S. Soccer Federation. This is one of the situ- situations where... I, I, my prior knowledge, my, the, my back knowledge of these events actually kind of was detrimental to my enjoyment of the documentary in that I felt it was like so surface level in so many ways that it, it's not really adding enough. And in fact, there's no even, it, there's no even presumption of, of unbiasedness. This is firmly in the camp of behind, being behind the U.S. Women's National Team, to the point where they don't even really fully articulate the arguments that they're arguing against in a way that makes the whole film f- sort of feel like it, la- a little deflated, right? Like, That's you don't know what... You don't really know what they're arguing about in you detail. You need the whole picture, yeah. As, 
as things uh, go go along, right? So it ends up just feeling like this piece of like uh, high, you know, high paid activism on behalf of the women's soccer team, and it's like I, even though I back their fight in many ways, it, the the documentary just doesn't do a good job of presenting the situation. So I, I felt it was just a little bit thin to really glean much from it. But if you just want a chance to hear from some heroes of U.S. soccer to watch some interviews with Megan Rapinoe and get some behind-the-scenes Zoom call footage that looks kind of dramatic, but they can't actually tell you what's happening because of NDAs, they've got oh. that. Um, okay. but you're the, you're the bigger th- soccer fan. I also yeah. didn't see this stock. But I know this was, like, especially around the time when we weren't seeing the U.S. men's soccer team. It was the U.S. women's soccer team that was, like, dominating. What mm-hmm. do you? What should they have added? What do, what do you feel, like, would have fleshed it out a bit more? Well, you know, I think, I think one of the problems with it is that they only really focus on this one aspect of how the women get paid. That the men get these... That the men are... Uh, promised these gargantuan bonuses in comparison to the bonuses that the women get. But I think what they miss is covering all the nuances of the game and the other things that the women don't face. For example, most of the men who play on the national soccer team are making a lot of money playing soccer in Europe and don't really even need uh, stipends from the national team. Most of the women are struggling to find that kind of full-time work, whether it is here or in Europe where the women's soccer leagues just don't pull in the kind of money to pay the same that the men do. So the U S Federation, I feel like has almost like an obligation to these women under a different circumstance than just the fact that they're successful. It's the mm-hmm. fact that they, you know, they're trying to create this program. That's like the, you know, the, the gold standard for women's soccer across the nation, but they, there are certain things about the experience of those athletes that I think it's un, as much as we want to try and talk about like equal pay for equal work, the work is never equal based on what's asked of the women's team. So it's just much more nuanced than, than this documentary wants to get into. But, gotcha. Okay. You know, those, Something that nuance doesn't get 90 minutes on HBO Max. <laughs> I'll check it out. Yeah. Uh, how about No Straight Lines, The Rise of Queer Comics? This was one that Solid. you caught. I'm, first of all, I'm a big fan of comics. Finally being able to get back in, catch all the graphic novels that I missed in 2020. Yeah. I used to be a, a – I even got some right here. I used to be a collector of some some single issues all the time. That was my jam. And, uh, yeah, I understand why people do trade paper bags. It's so much easier. <laughs> yeah, way easier to collect. Uh, way more uh, just cost-effective. But I love this behind-the-scenes look of just seeing not just um, the pioneers in the comic industry that were queer, but also just the influence that they have, the ability to be able to have uh, – breaking the boundaries of what comics were supposed to be not just like these little comic strips that were you know the funnies in the newspapers but that were actually able to get to a lot of different ways of thinking and can create a whole art form i have another comic that i have over here i guess i don't have it but ju- just the um the journey you're able to go on uh with characters when you're not dealing with the same type of beats that comics are known for and you're able mm-hmm. to do different types of drawings there's a certain point where Bechtel herself comes out. And I was like, oh, that's, that's, that's the woman that the Bechtel test is based off of. And you're seeing just the drawings that she did. And she's talking about how many times, you know, she was, you know, very pro-feminist herself. But she found herself always drawing men. She's like, why? It's this whole system that makes you draw characters the way they are. You know, it's like superheroes. It's not just the women that look scandally. Every dude in a superhero comic looks like what? <laughs> you know, these unrealistic uh, expectations that they have. In comics and just the idea that when you're able to give somebody the ability to create that isn't that mainstream, the amount of influence that they can have. And I thought it was a very good look at not just the artist, but the different interpretations that they were able to have on the medium itself. So I'd highly recommend this one, as well as the book. I'm awesome. blanking on the book that it reminded me of a lot, but there's this uh, how to make comic books that really breaks down how you're able to use these panels and the different imagery to evoke something that you can't in movies and that you can't in TV or any other visual medium. It's just specific to graphic novels. So, highly recommend it. Yeah. 
<laughs> that one was directed by uh, Vivian Kleinman. Uh, moving on to The Price of Freedom, which was directed by Judd Ehrlich. This one is about the NRA and sort of the nice. NRA's rise in prominence in political influence and just cultural influence in the United States. And particularly in how the NRA has become a big challenger to any sort of gun, tr- gun control legislation. And while I, I do think there is an interesting documentary to to be made about the subject like this, I think it just goes a little bit light in its investigation. It, it's much more of like a of a of a piece by piece reconstruction of how the NRA sort of grew into power and less of like an analytical look at why they were able to grow into power. Right. And I'm a little bit more interested in, I'm a little less interested in like the fact that the NRA is this hugely influential gun lobby. I'm a little more interested in, in why it was able to get that place. What, it, what it says about us that the NRA has become so appealing to so many people uh, and, and why, you know, it's allowed to persist despite the fact that many people uh, oppose the NRA's hardline stance on gun control. It, it's just not enough of an investigation for me. And one of those documentaries that kind of just tries to prescribe the problem, but not necessarily like address it. Mm. Um, so it, it was a little bit light for me. I maybe, maybe some people would be more interested, but yeah, not, not the best documentary in the festival for me. Uh, Price of Freedom. There was a short, maybe Sundance could have been South by, it's called The Rifleman. It's a short film about one of the guys who like founded the NRA. Uh, mm-hmm. Have that one on your radar, maybe. It, that one's cool. Yeah. That one does it more like a story mode. It tells you his past and it tells you his present. And it does a nice comparison between the past and the present. Cool. One that I definitely liked a little bit more is Socks on Fire. This one's mm. directed by Mo McGuire. It's uh, about this, this one. About a poet who returns to uh, his hometown to uh, document the the squabble between his homophobic aunt and his drag queen uncle uh, after their grandmother dies and leaves her estate in their hands. It's uh, it takes place in Hol- uh, what is it? Uh, Hoax Bluff, Alabama. So there's all these oh. sort of cultural influences going on in this family drama. But the way that it's put together is this really interesting mix of archival documentary footage, contemporary footage that he tries to catch of his family, and then these recreations using actors that try and get recreate certain moments, recreate certain feelings. It's not a... It's not a film that's really interested in giving you a play-by-play of how things went down. It's more about the feelings of those moments, about the lasting images and ideas that stick with you. I think a lot of it is about the effect that trauma has, and particularly trauma when it's inflicted on you by somebody who you care about. Okay. Um, it's very poetic, and some of the imagery in this movie is really beautiful, particularly the like titular imagery of socks on fire on a laundry line. I think speaks greatly to what they're trying to address in this movie. I think it's a, a really fascinating look. It, I, th- I mean this as a compliment. It had the feeling of a short film to me in its experimental nature, in the kind of like lightness with which it moves between moments. It even though it is almost 90 minutes long, it, it feels very kind of like dreamlike. Okay. Uh, and, and yeah, I don't know. I, li- I liked it. I liked a lot about it. Uh, I kind of want to revisit it. So maybe check this one out. Let me know what you think. Cause I want to be able to talk about it with somebody. Okay. All right, all right, the last documentary that we caught out of Tribeca is Stockholm syndrome. Let's this is go. the architect's profile of ASAP Rocky, notably his time, uh, being locked up in Sweden on assault charges, uh, which was a, a dominate a, a, a big news story. I think it was it 2019. Yeah, uh, I didn't even realize it'd uh, been so long already. You know, that right? It's an interesting documentary that's part a profile of Rocky and his mm-hmm. life story, but also really focused on his time in Sweden and the case behind uh, behind it, and also his response to to being locked up. Art, what were your thoughts on Stockholm Syndrome? 
uh, I, first I thought it was called Stockholm. I kept telling Zach this. I was like, I just thought it was yeah. like called that for a reason. The being called Stockholm syndrome is ends up being like a big theme in the movie. But like Zach said, it is a profile on him. They do these very interesting animations. They switch up the style many times to show you either flashbacks of how he grew up in New York with his family. Yeah. Um, his different influences. Claymation to kind of show you what it's yeah. like in his cell. And sometimes it's sketches and different things. Uh, and I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, I'm a big Rocky fan, so uh, just seeing not just him, but the whole ASAP mob, you know, from Yams to uh, Ferg and everybody who was there. And they get into the ASAP uh, mob for a whole section of it, too. Yeah, which was cool. Um, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty solid doc. Could it have been a little bit... M- could they have gone a little bit deeper? Sure. The, the substance mm-hmm. doesn't come in until after the halfway points in the movie. It's a lot of setup before you get to what is really the meat. And it's yeah. not that they, they they pass by it and they go, hey, this is what we want to talk about on Rocky's reflection on certain things, which was cool to see. But obviously not everyone is going to accept it. But he doesn't flash by it. But he doesn't also go as deep as I thought he was going to, in my no. opinion. And I wonder if this is sort of the same thing that I was feeling after I watched the Demi Lovato documentary is that maybe oh, I will put is, it that low, but yeah, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> it's it maybe this is a little bit too soon for him to have fully reflected and fully that. wrapped his head around it. Yes. Right? Because it's like the, these things take time to intellectually process, and I don't know if he has the distance where it feels like he's really commenting on it. He's also so much working. as he's just kind of reacting. He's working. Bit. It's almost like this is the movie that needs to be made to react to the situation that happened so you're on the record. Because he hasn't really been on the record. So he made a movie instead. No. One of the best things, and I'll, and I'll quote it right here. Once he's able to get out, he goes to go visit the one of the biggest producers himself, Rick Rubin. And Rick Rubin says, I feel like films about the making of an album or about what's going on around an artist's life, I feel like a film might replace what an album used to be. Like the thing that we remember about an artist for a period of time. We're seeing that in the movie that ASAP Rocky is saying. That is fully reflective of the movie that we're seeing there. This is him reacting Mm -hmm. to that moment. And that's why I say like it's it's not as low as what I would say the Demi Doc was, which is a lot of like, let me get the record straight. Um, Yeah. This hit is it is him reflecting back, but it's like right in the middle. It isn't fully going as deep as he could have, but that only comes with time. So I still mm-hmm. appreciate the doc for what it is. I love seeing uh, not just his creative process is coming up. That whole situation, they really break it down. They, sh- they, they um, again, also show you uh, and animate how the court went down, the whole procedural, yeah. how they were fighting against it. Everybody who got involved. And then the aftermath to it, the lessons that he learned. And that's where the title really comes into play. And uh, clearly Rocky fans loved it because before this had premiered, you know, it, it had some decent press coverage from it. After the fact, it became the highest rated Tribeca movie, not doc, movie of this year when you when you look at the list. Um, Letterboxd, I don't know yeah. if it's that great, but nonetheless, if you're a Rocky fan, I, I know you're going to eat this up. And in terms of Rocky, I hope he, uh, he sticks to it, to what he says in the documentary. Yeah, and it is interesting to you know get that life story and get a bit of that reflection, even if it isn't necessarily like they don't they don't probe him too deeply. I feel like the that, the architects, the directors of this documentary, are so like fascinated by by him as a person that they almost don't want to push him in certain ways. Yeah, I was a little bit surprised when twenty minutes in, we'd heard more from Kim Kardashian than we did from Rocky. There was a lot of Kim K. That's a lot of Kim. That's a lot of. She's kind of the second biggest person in this whole documentary. It was it was a promo for Kim K a little bit too, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, all right. So we'll get into the narratives from Tribeca in just a moment. But first, we would like to thank the Academy, those wonderful Patreon patrons who supported the show. They are Andrew Christensen, Tushar Sharma, Ewan Graf, Wasamata, and Awkward. Hey. Thanks again for su- for the support and a reminder that you too can become a member of the Academy at patreon.com slash intercut pod, where you can sign up for Patreon benefits like early access to the intercut episode outlines, access to the private channels on the intercut discord, or an invitation to our monthly patron Google meetings. Art, uh, where are people going to go for support the people to support the show on Patreon? 
We got the links down below over on Intercut. Uh, like I said, for $5 a month, you're able to help us out to not just watch all of these different things that we have right here, um, but all of the festivals, giving you the heads up on what's coming out. Uh, and that's thanks to all y'all's support over on Patreon.com slash Intercut. Is Intercut Pod? Intercut Pod. Oh, see, I had it right. Intercut Pod. That's short for podcast. There we go. <laughs> there you go. Now you get it. All right, let's get into the uh, narratives because there's a lot of interesting films that had their debut here at Tribeca. Uh, and of course, because we are in the post COVID year, we are going to get a couple of COVID themed movies. Zach, uh, they're not as bad. So, some are, but they're not as bad <laughs> as when, when, when we were in the midst of it and you and I talked on, the, on this show, we were like, Damn, we're going to get a lot of them in these festivals. And we knew it was mm-hmm. going to be in the festivals in particular, you know, because mainstream stuff, we'll see if it makes it or not. But we knew we were going to have to sit through a lot of these in these festivals. I'm glad mm-hmm. to say, at least for right now, to me, it's an 80% success rate of at least being yeah. decent. Of at least being yeah. decent. They do some stuff with and, it. And, so. and I think a lot of them also aren't as annoying about the COVID aspects of the story as yeah. we maybe anticipated them being, right? They're able to make COVID just the thing that's happening in the background in order to focus on the drama of Period piece. the people and the interaction. Period piece. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's. I think the perfect example of this is a movie like Seven Days. Mm-hmm. Which is directed by Roshan Sethi, and Roshan co-wrote it with the star with his star uh, Karin Sony. You may recognize Karin Sony. He's been in a lot of stuff. I first took notice of him in uh, uh, Safety Not Guaranteed. I think he's really funny in that movie. He's of course in Deadpool as well, uh, as well as a bunch of other stuff recently. Yeah, here he gets the chance to be the leading man in a story he co-writes. Co-stars with Geraldine Viswan Nathan, who we like a lot, showing yeah, up she's in great. films like Blockers and Bad Education. The story here is when the world goes into lockdown while they're on a date organized by their traditional Indian parents. Ravi and Rita are forced to shelter in place as COVID-19 intensifies. And, you know, as far as like rom-com setups go, this is basically the same idea as what is it, uh, Two Night Stand with Miles Teller, where they just oh. get snowed in, right? Like, yeah. it, it, this is like a, a pretty traditional setup. People get stuck in a place. They just are using COVID as the inciting incident. So it, it actually does allow you to focus on like the the comedy of these personalities clashing with each other. And I think you know because they're both really charming actors, it's it's fun for a lot of the movie. His sort of uptightness and cleanliness matched with her more looseness and lack of uh, lack of traditional values, if that's what you yeah. want to call them. It's a good odd couple match, even if I find her character to be a little bit Manic Pixie Dream girl list in how thin she was. Um, but I, I was charmed by it. It's mildly funny, and the performances are good. I don't know if you were able to catch Seven Days. I did, um, yeah, and like you said, it, it is that type of movie where you... you not just have the COVID aspect of it, but it's also their their culture background to it as well that's able to play off a bunch of different riffs. I agree with you on her character as well. Uh, I do love her as an actress. I always forget she's British, bro. I see her. I, I listened to the interviews and I was like, see, you didn't even know that. Yo, go, go catch her. <laughs> I have never seen her do anything but an American accent in the movies that she's in. On top of that, uh, the lead and the director, uh, they were talking about in, in the post interviews that they're actually a couple. The director oh. himself, yeah, the director himself is a doctor. Hmm. He shot this, wrote this during the period of time when he was on leave. That's hilarious. So I think that's yeah, that's some interesting behind the scenes to it. Like, yeah, I agree with you on her character as well. Sometimes it goes like a little too over the top on making her seem kind of. And again, it's just because he's playing the uptight, like following the rules that everything's so safe. Yeah. That it kind of makes her character a little bit more questionable, I I guess. But uh, I thought it was a cute little movie. Uh, and I would be curious to see who's who picks it up. Yeah, definitely. Another one of the COVID set movies is As of Yet. This was the Nora Ephron Award winner. Taylor Guerin, who wrote, uh, wrote and co-directs with uh, Chanel James, is the uh, star here as well. I was familiar with her. She's pretty pretty big on Twitter, pretty funny on Twitter. Also a, a writer for Reductress, which is kind of like a Onion-like uh, web- website for more feminist-type satire. So okay. I, I came in really expecting uh, her to bring a lot of funny, but I think there's a lot of stuff that really worked for me here. And I, I actually want to talk about it by talking about your rating scale, because I don't always use uh, your rating scale. Uh, Welcome. Yeah, 
the the famous combo price, junior price, rent it, stream it, yeah. uh, skip it. But this is like I think the kind of perfect movie to to rate on that scale because I think when you give a movie like this like a three stars or a four stars, people are going to come in and be like, I don't know, I don't think that was like really a three star or a four star movie or something like that. But what it is is like a pleasant watch, like a a a good stream it in my opinion. Thank you. Because it's like a a really cleverly constructed movie. It's one of those movies that is so feels so effortless that I think the wrong person would mistake it for being easy to make. Yes. And I don't think what she did was easy to make here. No. I, th- again, this is another one where we've seen a lot of people do the COVID movie where right before COVID begins, the, the movie's taking place right in, in early 2020 and they go, oh, we're going to invest in stocks and you know what we should do is do this and maybe we should get more toilet paper. It's like they're, they're making jokes on what's going to happen. This is within a world where she's trapped at home and all the conversations that she's having on Zoom, which the movie pitches itself as being completely on Zoom calls, they lied. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, granted, it's a very uh, good character interaction that they have with that moment, but I thought they were going to stick to their guns on that. But for the majority, it, it really is all done on Zoom calls mm-hmm. and done to the degree like it or is video grainy. video messages. Yeah, it, it's grainy. You can see the audio coming out, which is another reason why it definitely uh, works as a stream. But the conversations that they have, the nuances there. I'm sure a lot of people have had these conversations. Which side do you fall mm-hmm. on? I don't know. I don't, 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 don't want to know for some of them. But you have some really good discussions, and a lot of them are funny. They catch you off guard. When when Quinta appears, I was like, damn. That whole discussion that they had back and forth, I thought was hilarious. And just a lot of the moments um, where they're, they're having these discussions the way you would in real life, where it gets to a point where the conversation's getting deep, dark, tense, and then people reel it back. You know, you try to make sure that uh, you don't want to fully offend the other person. So uh, I I think the trajectory in the way that they're able to have these awkward conversations where you're literally on the phone. Are you going to hang up? I think they really got the Zoom call well. You know, they're not pulling that stuff where so many movies think you just close the computer and it's done. It's like the awkward goodbye. Yeah, a a lot of the dialogue had this really naturalistic quality to it in in how, like, not showy it was. And also the the awkwardness of some of those interactions just felt so so precise in a way that I wouldn't be surprised if it was improv, but it's also a little bit too too precise to not be – to to not be – a little bit too precise to have been completely improvised. Like maybe it's that uh, curb your enthusiasm type of partially written script thing. It's not trying to but, be PC either. They will say things that w- that would come up in a regular conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th- that's the thing is that these conversations were so much uh, like the conversations that I found myself having or found myself overhearing or or it just has this way about it that feels so naturalistic that again I just don't think is as easy to do as it as it seems and mm-hmm. I think there's a real talent in that and I even though this is a very slight story I I really appreciated it. it it made me think of like some of the Joe Swanberg stuff that I like a lot because sometimes he has these small ambition movies that are just really lifelike and I appreciate that quality to them Duplass brothers they're the producers on Duplass this, so. yeah it's there you go all the all the Mumblecore gang. All right, Brighton Fourth. This was the international narrative feature film winner, and it also was the uh, best actor winner and best screenplay winner Damn. from uh, Tribeca this year. Directed okay. by Levan Kogual Shvi. I'm, I'm not going to pronounce that one correctly. Uh, this one is about a Georgian wrestler who travels to Brooklyn in order to help his son out of a gambling debt. And it's a it's an interesting low key story that kind of immerses you in this Georgian culture and these people. Even though it is largely set in Brooklyn, it's all in this like subculture of these uh, Im- Georgian immigrants and the what it's like in the the dinners they have with each other, the songs they sing with each other. And like, I, I think the way in which it's sort of immersed in that culture does give it a bit of a unique quality. But, but the thing that I think is most interesting about the film is the way that it presents this masculinity. All these characters are either they're uh, gangsters and thugs of some kind, or they are former wrestlers. So they're men who have physicality to them and they, they are, they need to show their dominance and they like to, like to act tough the way in which that 
can come to undermine some of their interactions and their ambitions, I think is really interestingly presented in this movie. Uh, it's a little bit low key, but I, I still thought I thought it was good and thought it was really well acted. So I would definitely say that's one to keep an eye on, okay. as is Catch the Fair One. Uh, this is one that I had my eye on because it is directed by Joseph Vla- Vladika, who had previously done another Tribeca movie I saw called Manos Sucias. A few years ago, that one was produced by Spike Lee, and this one is produced by Darren, Darren Aronofsky. Aronofsky. So he's already gotten a pr- couple pretty awesome cosigns in his short career. He's also done some TV work. He did a few different episodes of Narcos and stuff like that. So he's been immersed in making these kinds of thriller types of films and shows here it's a story about a native american woman a boxer who goes in search of her missing sister who became embroiled in a sex trafficking ring and her uh, solution to doing that is to entering the sex trafficking ring herself i think this is a movie that has some of the qualities of like those low boil taylor sheridan type of thrillers where um you know, it's very quiet. It's very deliberately deliberately paced, but there is this kind of visceral violence to it. Uh, I thought it was a pretty solid thriller, although you know, maybe like a minor one. Uh, mm-hmm. Probably like a good streaming watch. What do you think about Catch the Fair One? Solid little thriller. I think if you're going in there for the story, uh, definitely see it more as a stream. It. Um, I remember her saying in the movie in particular because I know she's not. She's also a real life boxer, boxer the actress that they got, uh, and an activist. I remember in the movie she said she was from these islands off of Africa. And I know that that ended up being like the really big through line in the movie where you are following this sex trafficking thriller. But at the same time, there's almost this idea of like cultural genocide type stuff. Like that's Mm -hmm. what they were talking about in the in the film as well. That the idea of like you you are slowly getting rid of a a certain part of society um, through these means. Uh, Again, that's, that's like very subtle in the background if you're coming at it as a thriller decent little thriller i'd highly recommend it as a as a stream it the one thing that i had though is that the bass was so damn loud in this movie dude like i had to keep turning it down because it was just like boom 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 but i think it has a pretty uh a pretty good um plot that you follow throughout um with a Interesting ending. Uh, I'll put it there. It may not appease everybody, but they went for it. And mm-hmm. I know that that was going to be the ending that they were always going to go for. Yeah. Yeah. Dating and New York. This is a uh, rom- rom-com of sorts with a pretty charming cast. I think that's what drew both of us to it. Notably Jabuki Young White in a starring role. Also, uh, you have Francesca Real, Catherine Cohen, Brian Muller, Jerry Ferrara, Eva Victor, who showed up in this and in As of Yet. Uh, she's like a rising New York comedian for for these types of movies, I guess. You know, this one has aspirations of being kind of like a I don't know, I don't know, like a a, a mixture YouTube of video. <laughs> this is a really I was, good. What's that MTV show like? Uh, girl. Uh, uh, what's the guy's guide to whatever uh, yeah. that was on MTV all those years ago? Sure, it's like a mixture of that and like a rom com tone because it tries to sort of analyze the whole situation of dating, but it does it through these kind of cheesy, you know, dating app screens and these oh, this over the top voiceover that just constantly undermines any sort of momentum that this movie has. You know, the only times where I was really enjoying it is when we just got to see the characters interacting because they have very charming actors here. But when it just was explaining everything with this narration, it just it just went on and on and on. There's maybe some moments here, but yeah, I didn't respond to this one. I liked a lot of the aspects in the scripts, a lot of the dialogue moments when they're talking back and forth. It almost mm-hmm. felt like they were trying to be like a modern Woody Allen. Uh, they name yeah. drop uh, Nora Ephron as well. So, you know, they're trying to be this like in the digital age. This is what it's like dating in New York. And, and it kind of achieves that. I say YouTube video mainly because it would have been more successful, I guess, seeing this as a sketch, perhaps. Mm-hmm. And that has a lot to do with the editing. Oh my lord, the editing! Oh my lord, the the music, just blasts in. It, it is it it comes in almost like it's it's a sketch, and the music blares in for whatever it's supposed to be. A lot of the graphic design that they do for the movies. Did you catch the uh, Easter egg for searching? 
No. Because I'm searching Easter egg at the beginning. I wanted oh, wait, the Tinder was profiles. Anish in it? <laughs> yeah. At yeah, first that's I thought it was I, I, Anish uh, voicing, too, because it sounded a lot like him, uh, the yeah. narrator. And I was just like, oh, okay. I think the narrator is uh, Jerry Ferrara. He's, yeah, it, it ends up being... But they, they they thank the searching boys in the in the credits as well. There's a lot oh. that I like in the movie. It just it I, 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 the budget could have been a little bit bigger. And I think mm-hmm. if they tightened up a lot of the um, the moments because they are funny in the movie. I do find them funny. I yeah. think a lot of the scenarios that they have, <laughs> but it ends up feeling a little awkward. And it I don't know. It doesn't punch. There's as certainly much as ideas they think. there. Like I, there's a moment where they're they're cutting between the girl talk and the guy talk, yeah. And they have the girls with their legs overlapping, and then they cut back to the boys with their legs overlapping yeah. in the same way. Like that, it's a funny cut, but it's just not really chock full of those that stuff. Uh huh. And I and I like the cast, so I know that I can't recommend it as much to the degree that I like it because other people will see this, have no connection to it, and be like, "Yo, this is booty." Same. Uh, and again, if they if they cleaned up the technical aspects a bit more and made it a little bit tighter. I, I could see it having some potential, but it's a decent stream if you're interested in the trailer whenever it drops. False positive. This one should be hitting Hulu by the time so this podcast definitely a stream is it. available. <laughs> Directed by John Lee. It's a story about a woman who fails to get pregnant, uh, finally finds her dream fertility doctor, but after becoming pregnant with a healthy baby girl, Lucy begins to notice that some things don't seem right uh this is a kind of horror adjacent thriller slow burn thriller that i think has shades of rosemary's baby in terms shades? of its influence shades? in terms of its, okay it's it's very explicitly going for a modern rosemary's baby type of situation it but it never really gets to that same level of like paranoia and horror from the situation through because it just feels a little bit hokily constructed and you know you i you see through it a little bit too quickly like in rosemary's baby it it it's like you're you're going delirious from the the, the way in which people are contradicting the, uh, their stories and then in this it just kind of feels like movie making in terms of the 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 ropes being or the strings being pulled around her it, this one also notably stars Alana Glazer in what is like not really meant to be a very comedic role. There's maybe mm-hmm. moments here. I I like her a lot, but I didn't really like her that much here. She felt super muted and yes. like the things that make her special were just they just told her to not do any of them in this movie. Yeah. Justin Theroux was also kind of like a blank space in the movie. Pierce Brosnan is pretty fun I, as yeah, this he was very great. creepy a very like creepy, almost a like cult leader type of figure. But ultimately, the even though some of the twists were ones that I didn't see coming, they weren't ones that I found like gratifying to watch either. Mm-hmm. I knocked out halfway through this movie, so I'm not giving it a full yeah. rating. I will be. I know we got sent a screener, and it will be out on Thursday. But Alina finished it, and I was like, "Was it this, this, and this?" She's like, "It was that, that, and that." <laughs> so yeah. I guess I guessed it. Um, but yeah, from the first half that I saw. I will judge it. I, I can't. I have to. Ju- I have to finish it. So I won't say it. Yeah. But doesn't seem like it's that. All right. Justice of Bunny King. It's about Bunny King, a mother of two, played by Essie Davis of the Babadook. She battles the system, trying to reunite with her children, ultimately taking in her niece Tanya. Tanya is played by Thomas and McKenzie. So a couple notable actors here. Are I tried to watch this one I and I just you, could not get the uh australian accents i just there's a little bit too much whispering and man i this is why i prefer the the sundance experience because i get those subtitles, those subtitles man, were I, great. I great oh, i miss it i miss it i'll catch up with this one eventually but yeah tell me uh, tell me more about the justice of bonnie king uh it was a pretty solid story uh you're mainly covering her trying to find a way to see her kids you know she's just struggling to get by and it's like that story of like the will power to to be there she's going up against like needing to have a place real estate wise but they're not able to give one to her obviously so she's like always just trying to like scam her way to a degree and then you have her mm-hmm. niece who's played by thomas and mckenzie who's already been in leave no trace so they're kind of she's kind of doing that again where she can't be spotted by the authorities 
and such. And while it's a drama at the beginning, it's got some tense parts t- uh, towards the end as she's, uh, again, the whole movie, uh, her trying to connect to her children. And I will say the strongest part of the movie was her performance. So I think if you've seen S.E. Davis, not just in The Babadook, I also thought she did a great job in Baby Teeth. Then I yeah. would highly recommend it. Also Australian, so if you have a problem with those accents, make sure you wait for the subtitles as well. Last film show. This one is about a nine-year-old boy in a remote village in India who begins a lifelong love affair with cinema after he bribes his way into a run-down movie palace and spends his summer watching movies from the projection booth. Art, this is a cinephile's dream come true. This, this story is like catnip to people like you and me. I almost feel like we're not appropriately qualified to be Too critical biased. of a movie like this uh, because you know at, even though it, there's maybe aspects of it that I'll, I'll, I'll say were a little bit slow or a little bit like ill-defined for me over I couldn't help but just smile from ear to ear throughout this movie because of the way that it captures that sort of like transient nature of childhood and the kind of like way that you, you find it, it, when you're a kid you just sometimes find yourself in situations you didn't expect that mm-hmm. sort of change your perspective plus there's a few scenes here in which they try to sort of recreate a, a movie theater for themselves that are just like magical like it, it just the power of movies in in a scene I, you know, I, I would like even fast forward to a specific scene just to show Caitlin because it's like wow. you have to see this part, you know. So it's like there's just a couple of moments that I found so beautiful that stuck with me. It's not necessarily like the deepest story out there, but I, I think, I think the way that it evokes, evokes the way that film is transportative and can really affect you was really good to me and and better than I've seen articulated in some other movies that maybe sound like they have a similar idea behind them, you know? The combination of the childhood story and this cinematic cinematic uh, structure really worked for me. I, I, this is one that I definitely hope that you can catch up with at yeah. some point soon. I, is, yeah, I hate that I missed it. This was one that I really yeah. want to catch. Let's get into Mark Mary and some other people. It won the best screenplay in a U.S. narrative. This one is written and directed by Hannah Marks. It's about Mark and Mary who, after they after getting married, decide to open up their relationship to other partners. And I think we've seen quite a few movies that try to wrestle with this idea of polyamory in terms of a, like a romantic comedy and. I went in sort of expecting a movie that's a little more focused on the sexual politics of that. But what I got out of it was something that's way more into the dynamics of a relationship and 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 going through the ups and downs with a partner and, and you know, trying to adjust to, to that partner. I, I in in that way, I ended up really, really liking this movie in a because it has a really interesting quality in that they get the way in which relationships sometimes evolve over time, right? Mm-hmm. It, that that a couple who meet cute and look like they should fall to fall in love and be together forever are going to be different people in, a couple years down the road. So I really like that, and I really like the performances, particularly from the two leads in uh, Ben Rosenfield and Haley Law. It, it's just a very charming movie. I, I would definitely recommend people keep an eye out for um, Mark, Mary, and some other people. Uh, I thought the lead was also uh, she was in Spontaneous, the one with uh, where the, all the kids' heads are blowing up in high school and they have to deal with that. I don't know if you've heard of that movie. Uh, she was just as funny yeah, yeah, in yeah. that, so it's like I, I definitely oh, nice. feel that that she's gonna she's gonna have a really good comedic career. It's also directed by Hannah Marks, who is an actress turned director producer. Yeah. Some of you may know her acting from like Banana Splits, that one movie with right. where they, where they're fighting over one of the the Sprouse brothers. But I had also seen. One of her directing features, After Everything, which used to be called Shotgun, uh, when I saw it at Chicago Critics, then they changed the name of it. That one had starred Jeremy Allen White and Micah Monroe, another relationship movie that has to deal with uh, cancer. Um, but you're following, again, that same type of structure where the way that they meet, as time and things change, it, it changes mm-hmm. the relationship. So uh, that is very much a drama. This is very much more a comedy. And I thought a lot of the jokes... Uh, uh, worked out. It was pretty cute. I would give this one almost close to a rent it, uh, but I'm curious to see who picks it up because I know a lot of her movies, uh, for the most part at least, have been able to do pretty well on streaming. Yeah, definitely, and and hopefully this is like a, a career on the rise, you know, because she 
has this unique energy to it too. Mm -hmm. So I like that one. All right, let's get into The Novice. This was the big narrative winner at this year's Tribeca Film Festival. It won not only Best Actress and Best Cinematography, but the Best U.S. Narrative Feature Film Prize for Lauren Hathaway's directorial debut. Uh, this one is about Alex Dahl, a college freshman who joins her university's rowing team and undertakes an obsessive physical and psychological journey to make it to the top varsity boat. I had an interesting experience watching this one because I was watching with Caitlin, who did uh, rowing throughout high school. She and, did and, rowing? And knows this world fairly well. Damn. Uh, they they mentioned the erg tests. And at what she Caitlin says, yeah, my best ever erg time was 8.2. And then she, she like writes down on a piece of paper, goal time, 8.0 or something like that. Um, it, it So it was able to... She was able to lend me a little bit of like commentary and critique their rowing form and stuff along the way. But I thought this was a really interestingly put together movie. You know, I, I remarked to you that it reminded me of a certain movie. And then I looked into Lauren Hathaway's credits and wouldn't you know it? She happened to be a sound editor on that movie. Hap that movie happens to be Whiplash, Whiplash, another film about like an obsessive uh, young person trying to ga uh, gain, you know, uh, become better in their chosen field. Yeah. I think the cinematography, the sound design worked extremely well in this movie, the way in which you kind of see her become transported through the act of rowing is really cool. I think maybe I was a little bit not as into the, the story and felt like her motivations were a little bit muddled in terms of uh, in different spots. I don't even know that it was muddled. I feel like it just wasn't fully, and I don't want to say spelled out, but like even in the description and a lot of the, the people who were talking about it, like they really pushed that mm -hmm. she's also a queer college student, but I never mm -hmm. really saw that in the movie because you're more focused on her. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there was like extra aspects to it. Maybe I missed it or, or, or there were scenes that, that, were, that were cut from it, but I see what you mean. It's still reflected in the, the the people around her who see her as like just nobody wants to hang out with her. It's not that she's bad at what she does. It's just she just has no communication to work with everybody else. And that's what reminded me also a lot about Whiplash, where she's trying to be the best. She doesn't care if anybody else is getting in the way of it. Mm -hmm. I really love the way that it was shot. There's some really great imagery, uh, especially yeah. when you're getting to the rowing scenes, uh, when when they contrast that first shot where you just see this image and I, I didn't really know what it was. Then you, you kind of get to see uh, what it represents. But I thought it was a pretty solid thriller, and uh, I would give this one close to a junior. Yeah, definitely. I think it was totally one of the standouts from uh, from this year's festival. And did you know the actress is in The Orphan? She is The Orphan. <laughs> That's what every letterbox <laughs> review is about, feels like. All right. Poser, another one of the films from the festival that I liked quite a bit. It's directed by Ori Segev and Noah Dixon. Uh, this one's about Lennon, who l exists on the sidelines of the Columbus, Ohio indie music scene, sort of tries to work her way in to that scene and does it through a podcast where she records and interviews various artists trying to find a way to get closer to them until she settles on this one singer, Bobby Kitchen, and she uh, becomes a becomes quite obsessive over her. Uh, the way that this movie sort of transformed, it was a little bit interesting to me because watching the beginning of it, I don't know if this is totally out of left field, but just in the, the cinematography and sound design of it, it almost reminded me of Last Black Man in San Francisco as like this kind of ode to a city and an environment. Obviously, you know, very different in, in terms of the, the type of situation it's depicting. But then it sort of, uh, it, it loses a little of that, of that observational quality and focuses in on these characters and sort of her obsession and uh, becomes a little bit of more of this like single white female thing, which w ended up pretty cool. I think it's really interesting in the way that it tries to depict her as somebody who wants so badly to be part of something that she's willing to, to, to cross some lines to, to get in, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a cool story, really well shot, really beautifully shot. Yeah, I, I thought this one was cool. I didn't get to fully catch this one, but uh, I know you and Amanda were talking good things about it, so I definitely need to catch this one. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think one it of the was uh, 
one of the clips one of, of it, yeah, as well. one of the clips of it was like she sees these people talking about a piece of art and then she goes there and it turns out she was recording them the entire time and then listens back to it so that she could feel like she is critiquing or observing the art as a poser as somebody else which i thought was really interesting so i'm very i'm very curious to actually uh, dig into this definitely one. definitely roaring 20s which was you got tell me yeah big long take yeah. this was the the international cinematography winner, I believe. This one, yeah, it's a single unbroken shot. Uh, the movie is really interesting in that way because I think we've seen uh, some different one-shot movies like 1917 or Birdman or even Victoria. Victoria. And w- one thing that I think this film does that's a little bit different is it's sort of so constantly on the move that it really feels like a tour of the city of Paris, right? Uh, I've, we've used the phrase baton pass a couple times on this podcast, but this is a real baton pass movie in that you're following one couple as they walk down the road for two to five minutes and then they bump shoulders with another couple and then you're off and you're following them you know it's uh, it's observational in that way but it's also uh, um it's also just like giving you these little slices of life uh it's not trying to give you a short story in every little interaction it's just kind of taking you through the city and giving you a story in terms of like the overall atmosphere of the city and Ultimately, I think that worked for me in parts because there are certain dialogues and certain characters that I was much more interested in than other people. Other people I just kind of grew bored with and was waiting for the baton to get passed uh, yet again. I also, you know, this was a cinematography winner. I wasn't that impressed with the cinematography. It felt a lot of times like they were the actors were getting too close to the camera. Like they, the cameraman needed to tell them to slow down or something. The thing that impressed me was just the production design of it. The, the getting onto a subway and meeting your actor at the next stop or the, you know, the running through the streets. And then you bump into someone at exactly the right moment where the camera can then follow them. Those aspects of it were really cool to me. Less so the story itself, even if it just kind of, it's a cool experience, you know, it's not something that I think I'd revisit. Okay. I was hearing uh, some yeah. people talk about how because you're following him, the camera's always moving, it, it was hard to read the subtitles, which is one of the things that I felt with one of the shorts that I know you really liked, the uh, temperature gun one. Yeah. Um, because they're doing so many visual stuff over here, but then the subtitles are, they decided to put them in the corner because they're kind of singing a song. So literally, Alina and I had a split. She read the subtitles. I watched the movie. Yep. <laughs> Did you feel yeah, a problem yeah. with that? Oh, yeah, I was definitely not getting every single p- a bit of dialogue. Um, okay. You know, that's one of the p- problems when you can't, like, they, they just need to put them on a background already. Like, I'm sorry, it's maybe not aesthetically pleasing, but it's better that I can understand everything that's being said in the movie than, like, yeah. I can't read half the subtitles. C for me. This is a really interesting thriller. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know you're disappointed that you didn't get a they catch. Took it it's out, about- yeah. A uh, blind former skier who, while she's cat sitting in a secluded mansion, is the mansion becomes subject to a home invasion, and Sophie, Sophie, the singer's only or the skier's only defense is <laughs> through an app called See for Me, where she connects to an operator who becomes her eyes for her. really interesting premise for one of these kind of home invasion thrillers, and I think there's enough like twistiness to this movie that kind of keeps you going along for the ride. There's just like also something cool to the practicality of it, right? Like you you hear a premise like that and you think, how are you going to actually put that into action? And it's it's a movie where they're clearly thinking about the step-by-step of how this would work and how they would uh, be able to up the stakes and keep things, keep things tense. It was really, it was really solid for me. I thought it was really effective. I kept me on the edge of my, my, my seat. I thought the performances were really good, particularly Skylar uh, Davenport in that lead role, somebody who actually is visually impaired, which really? I don't know if that's, I don't know how Damn. much it lends to the movie, but I do think it lends some kind of quality to it wow. to have an actually visually impaired person playing the lead in this kind of like action thriller in a weird way. So, okay. Yeah. I, I dug this one. I, I'm really excited for more people to check it out. I think it's going to be like a f- really fun. Like if this one ends up on Netflix, I would not be surprised to see okay, it end see up in the top 10 for a hit? weekend, you know? All right. That sounds dope. Yeah. I wanted to catch this one and I'm really upset that they took it out, especially because you, you gave me a thumbs yeah. up. You're like, make sure you catch this. Damn. All right. I'm on radar. All right. 
And we got uh, one more narrative, I think. It's Werewolves Within. This is the second feature directed by Josh Rubin. He previously did Scare Me. Uh, although this Woo! one is written... This one From is Sundance. written by Mishna Wolf. It's her first screenplay. Okay. And it's got a really delightful cast, particularly uh, I was happy to see Sam Richardson, somebody that I think is hilarious. Uh, he's the lead in this movie. You also have uh, Melania Weintraub, who most most commonly AT&T. known as the at t <laughs> girl, shows up here, is really delightful as the female lead in this movie. Uh, but also it's been a bunch of recognizable people like Harvey Guillen, who's on What We Do in the Shadows, uh, Mike Michaela Watkins, who's in uh, Brittany Runs a Marathon and did some SNL, Cheyenne Jackson. A really good cast here for a whodunit that takes place in like a remote, a remote like ski town, if you want to call it that. It's about this forest ranger who must keep the peace after a snowstorm confines the people to an old lodge while a mysterious creature is on the loose. This one is interestingly based on a VR game by Ubisoft. Ubisoft. That's kind of like a mafia-like game. So interesting premise for a movie. Art, what did you think about Werewolves Within? Uh, I thought it was delightful. I thought it was pretty funny. Like you said, the cast is fantastic as they're walking around the mm-hmm. neighborhood. They're playing these type of stereotypes, every single one of them, because the, the, it's like, what, upstate New York or something like that? Like, it's, it's in the part yeah. of New York where, you know, it's removed from the city. Um, so you have this clash of what they say, the hipsters who are coming for the scenery, and then the people of that town. Um with a split being that they're making a pipeline. So I, I figured like when you're when you're seeing all these characters, they all add different things uh, from the setting that when you take into account it's a video game, you are kind of mm-hmm. trying to figure out who could it be that may be responsible for the stuff that's happening. Uh, I thought a lot of the, the jokes were pretty funny. They hit. It, it shot beautifully as well. Uh, and overall, I thought it was pretty fun. And it has an ending that I want to talk to you about. Because I have a theory about it, too. So I think that this one might be a pretty big hit. I know that it's going to be released in VOD and possibly theaters. But once it hits streaming, I think it's definitely going to pick up a lot of steam. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's the kind of movie that has enough fun elements to it, enough fun people, that, and enough of like an intrigue to the whole premise that... It could probably be like a hit with some people, but I I agree. It's just like the dialogue and stuff is delightful. There's just all these little jokes that I really responded to. Like even even throwaway lines like "I'm gonna find out who killed your dead husband" is it's funny, you know. Um, so I, I like this one a lot, you know. But I think it, it's just so solidly charming throughout that it was even if the whodunit elements aren't that like mysterious or like intriguing, it's just fun throughout it's worth Mm -hmm. it's worth the ride worth the adventure agreed yeah so i think that does it for uh the the feature narratives we saw out of tribeca but wanted to spend a little bit of time on the short films art i don't know if there's any things that stood out to you but we could start also with the short film animated film headed to apple tv plus yeah blush look at them picking up some some Short films, now that we realize that streaming is the best the slate. place to have these things. You know, it was interesting. I don't know if you saw that Netflix has created a shorts clip. Uh, if you go to the mobile app, it looks just like TikTok. Hmm. If you have Netflix on your phone, you go to it, and they've pretty much clipped out moments from movies or shows or anything. And you just, just like TikTok, you're scrolling through and just getting these bits and pieces. Wow. Imagine if there were films that were also short that people could also consume from the comfort of their own home. You mean, um, you mean like quick bites of Quick films. bites to a degree. Uh, yeah. Qu- quibbies. <laughs> Blush is the first one that's going to be going to Apple that I know of. Uh, I think they've done maybe some shorter segment and stuff, but uh, Blush is a story, uh, kind of this cute story of, of this like, these two people who fall in love, one's a human, one's an alien. Uh, I don't want to say too much of it, but I thought it was a pretty uh, cute story that's definitely in line for what the stuff that Apple wants to be making. Um, it's silent as well, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think they, they yeah. say anything. Um, but Music, I found that one but to be yeah, cute. no no dialogue. Yeah, it, it was, it's beautifully animated. Um, so I think it's definitely going to be uh, effective once it goes up there. Another one that I caught was Waves. It is the story of a deaf guy who is getting ready to go to prom, and he goes to go get his hair cut, but he's got to decide, should he wait, or does he want to go with the barber that everybody's ignoring? A cute little story that I would recommend. What, what are some of the other ones you caught? Uh, we talked a little bit about Cracked, which was, I think, a, mm. a really good, small drama. One? I think this is... 
Yeah, well, so there's a couple movies in here that I think are are Spike Lee Foundation or Spike Lee funded, and I think are senior films for NYU Tisch kids because uh, he's a teacher at Tisch. Yeah. Uh, but this is one of those. I saw it was also had the Tisch label on it, but it's, it's a really good story and just uh, one of these like one of those films that feels really lived in. Feels like the dialogue uh, is great. It, it was somebody's personal story being translated into this film. So yeah, I, I liked Cracked quite a bit. The best narrative short winner was Girl with a Thermal Gun, which we, we touched on briefly, was but was really interesting. It's about this uh delivery guy who is doing pickups at a grocery store and he sort of develops this like is it supposed to be a dream romance? I felt like it was kind of like Definitely, fantastical. It's like a, yeah, because it's like a musical as well, as he's like yeah. picking up all the items. In his mind, he has created this fascination that when he sees her and he's picking up these items, it's a lot more than it really is. Yeah. It's one of those cool uh, musicals, though, where they integrate the dance moves into, like, everyday activities. So, like, he, he she's putting the thermal gun up to his head, and they're doing the, like, uh, disinfecting of the hands, and they turn that whole thing into a dance. Yeah. Which, it, I thought that was really charming. You mentioned, do you want to talk about uh, Navozande the Musician, which was oh. the winner for Best Animated Short? I'm glad it continues to win. This is one of our favorites out of South by Southwest. A beautiful animation that is, yeah. uh, without spoiling too much because it is a short, you pretty much have the servant who is presenting something to a king and through flashbacks you see how they got to that point in time mm-hmm. as they're the musician that plays for the king. Just fantastically drawn. Yeah, and, and a it's, gorgeous it's, animated style that kind of reminds you of like ancient, ancient Asian paintings. You know yes. what I mean? Uh huh. Yeah. So uh, definitely put that one on your radar. Like I said, some of the other ones I also saw Namu, which was an also an mm-hmm. animated um, film. Pretty much, you have this guy. It's kind of told from the perspective of like he's in this one area, and as he works, as he does all these different things, there's a tree behind him where they had a clock and a clock and another clock and it's just like you could just see the time and the pressures and what he decides to focus on building up and I thought that was a really nice uh, animated short to catch anything else that stood out to you? because I know we have a yeah, big one that uh, both no longer, you and I liked yeah well there's no longer suitable for use uh, which was a really interesting story about a what is it like a, a confident for the FBI confident and what happens when he's threatened with deportation because um, they're done basically with like the, yeah because essentially when they're no when they are no longer useful Super. to the FBI the FBI ha- reports them to ICE <laughs> i thought some of the i thought it was really interesting structured some of the dialogue wasn't the most believable to me but it, in terms of what its services and its story i thought it was really interesting so that's the one that I definitely would keep on your radar. The uncle's from Rami, uh, too. But there's two that we... Yeah, sorry? The uncle. He's the uncle from Rami. Oh, I didn't know that. Yep. So, yeah. But there's two shorts that I think we definitely wanted to spend a little bit of time on. Should we start with David or should we start with Coded? We'll start with Coded because I want to end with David. Coded tells the story of illustrator J.C. Landecker, whose legacy was whose legacy laid the foundation for today's out and proud LGBTQ advertisement. This one's directed by Ryan White and does a really interesting construction, combining some interviews with footage, with, with looks at the uh, archival illustrations, as well as some new illustrations used to recreate um, old scenes. I thought it was very beautifully put together in terms of uh, not only demonstrating Lane Decker's work and explaining his work in a way that really makes clear why it was so important, but also capturing the spirit of his work in how the documentary itself was present, uh, presented. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think sometimes a documentary can take on the 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 structure or the form of its subject, and that sometimes can even open you up even more to their artwork. So I really appreciated that about this. It's also telling you a really fascinating story and and giving you a lot of information about it. Um, the, The combination of what this film is about and how beautifully it's made makes me think that it's, it's, absolutely has to be a contender for best documentary short at the next Oscars. I would not be surprised at all to see it shortlisted at the very least. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you also have uh, Neil Patrick Harris doing the the voiceover in this film. It was pretty solid. Uh, highly recommended. I agree. And then just the, the way that it makes you 
take a double look at a lot of the paintings, one in particular <laughs> that one of them mentions. But yeah, I think this is, this is definitely one of the best. Absolutely. And David. And then <laughs> let's talk about David. I've, I'm really excited to mention this short film. I don't I'm think we've done it finally, on Intercut yet. I, I may have mentioned it tiny, have. a tiny bit for Chicago, but you hadn't seen it yet. Yeah. Now that you've experienced David, <laughs> tell me. I love this short film. I love this. Uh, it's directed and written by Zach Woods, who yes, sir. people probably know from Silicon Valley, although he's shown up in a the lot office. of comedies. Yeah. And this one stars Will Ferrell and William Jackson Harper. Uh, William Jackson Harper is a man seeking help from his therapist, played by Will Ferrell. And the the way in which the, it's able to present a situation that is emotionally rife and then immediately undercut it in this really kind of discomforting but hilarious way is so funny to me you know because it's one of those films where you really don't know whether or not to laugh and and then you get to a point where you just become so uncomfortable you have to laugh yeah it, I, I i really really like this one i just think it's kind of like it's a miracle of tightrope walking between mm-hmm. tones and the acting is so good here i think you know there's a point in the in the short film where you might think Am I supposed to be laughing at this? And then you remember that, like, they cast Will Ferrell, Ferrell. as the therapist for a reason. Yeah. You know? It's like all three were in a completely different movie, you know? Chidi's doing <laughs> yeah. his thing, and he's trying to be, like, he's actually an in-treatment on HBO, whereas mm-hmm. Will Ferrell is, is doing the Will Ferrell thing, where and everything that he's in, he's acting like he's in a drama while it's pitched to comedy. And, and then there's the character, uh, I don't know if it's a spoiler or not, but there's another character that gets introduced, right? Yeah, <laughs> and he's doing his own thing as well. Um, but I, I love that the editing choices were what, what took me back. Like you said, the way that they just switch up tones out of nowhere is what's so jarring. And I'm glad you finally got to experience David because it is one of the goofiest shorts mm-hmm. of the year. <laughs> There's a moment where Will Ferrell just says, "Oh no!" under his breath. That is the funniest line delivery I've seen in anything recently. Fantastic. It's so so good. This one used to get All right. So up. David. Yeah, that is our favorite short out of Tribeca. And it's a shame that, like, this is the kind of thing that really... I would like to see the day when places like HBO Max and Netflix try to go after stuff like this. Because this is the type of thing that's so easy to watch and and so would add so much valuable to a subscription like that. I don't know, man. Apple's picking stuff up. HBO Max does have a couple of shorts that that play at festivals along with the human voice that they picked up. So I I don't know why it's taking them a long time, but hey, I guess the Quibi, it it took Quibi to, to fail for them to realize, all right, let's take this content and see if we can make something with it. So... Exactly, exactly. All right, uh, but I think that's about all for our Tribeca recap. I think that was a bit of a masterpiece of a podcast. Uh, You can follow more from me, Zach Shevich, by following me on Twitter, Instagram, or Letterboxd at ZShevich. That's Z-S-H-E-V, as in Milana Weintraub, (laughs) I-C-H. Art. Where can people catch more from you? You can find me over at LME Explain on YouTube, Twitter, uh, and Letterbox, where we're talking about all these movies that we've been catching, all the stuff that's streaming, all the stuff that's back in theaters, baby. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like we said, all the festival stuff that we uh, will be covering throughout the rest of the year. Hopefully they continue being a virtual because I think it's not only just a great opportunity to bring uh, y'all some good picks, but the fact that you don't have to worry about being at that location, New York, Sundance, in the middle of the mountains in Colorado. You're able to watch it from the comfort of your own home. So I'm hoping that this year they continue to still roll those out and that they keep it till 2022. But Exactly. Yeah. We, we will be here. You can listen to every episode of the Intercut Podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, or your favorite podcatcher. I like Overcast. And then make sure you're subscribed not just to the audio podcast, but to the video feed as well on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash intercutpod, where you can catch our bright, smiling faces as we break down the latest in entertainment. Please leave us a comment, like the videos, consider heading over to iTunes to give us a five-star review. Been a, a little bit slack on some of those five-star reviews. I, I need I need some more of that validation from you guys. So leave the reviews. Uh, shout out to our listeners in Indonesia for putting us on the TV and film podcast charts out there. Another reminder, you can head over to patreon.com slash intercutpod to support our show for as little as $1 a month, although you get some fun benefits starting at $5 a month. So maybe look into that. Like our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages. All of them are at IntercutPod to get updates throughout the week from Art, 
from me and from all the guests that we feature here on Intercut. Thanks again for tuning in. And until next time, I'm not littering. I'm just excited. <laughs>